Hello, Dr. Churchill, and uh, this is Astronomy 308 into the Final Frontier. We are still uh, in our sea race phase, and uh, today we are going to talk about two other groups besides the Europeans, and that is the vast swath of Arabic lands in the Muslim countries that spread all the way from Liberian Peninsula, uh, where Spain is, along the northern uh, African continent, through Arabia, into the East Mediterranean, uh, along through India, and even into China. So it was a, a vast territory uh, that we're talking about. And then we're also going to talk about the Chinese, and this is going to be during the Ming Dynasty. And the reason that we're going to have this discussion about the Arab world, the Muslim world, and the Chinese world is the compare and contrast that we have with the Europeans. We've seen that the Europeans um, uh, were motivated by God, gold, and glory, and um, they had a, an attitude of takeism, if you will. And um, we've seen that they moved into the Americas and destroyed empires, uh, wiped out the peoples, colonized the area, and um, started the slave trade from Africa to the Americas. And then the Portuguese set up ports along the um, Indian and Eastern part of Africa the, and in Malaysia. And those ports then they used as places to which uh, set up trade routes and uh, they used slave labor in those ports. They were pirates and they disrupted the entire slave trade, uh, sorry, uh, trading that had been going on there for seven years, the monsoon marketplace. And so um, that brought us up to the year about 1520 or something like that. What we're, we're going to do now, we're going to back up a little bit and say, well, what was happening in parallel with what was going on in Europe in that time? What was happening in parallel in the, the Muslim world and the Chinese world? And it's a fantastic compare and contrast. And the consequences for the shape of the world, uh, again, are unfolded in this story. Uh, so what do we have? here on the front page, the Arabic world and the Chinese world, um, basically before, during, and then after the sea rays. So if we look at the left-hand side here, um, we can see the, the trading that goes on in um, the Muslim nations. And you might say that this, near their borders, this is the kind of thing that, that would happen. They would uh, have these regions, these regions of trade, and, and the, these regions had borders, and then they would, they would move to the borders and, and they would trade. And then they would stay in their, basically their, their small areas, apart from some people that occasionally traveled around. But for the most part, uh, the trading on land was done in this way. And the Arabs didn't really venture outside their borders. And, and they didn't need to. They had a vast expanse in the, on the globe. Uh, most of those who did trade, uh, uh, sorry, those who did um, pilgrimage through the Muslim world uh, would make the uh, trek to Mecca or the Hajj, and that was a highly coveted thing to do, and, and uh, it was uh, what you call a, an obligation, if you will, as a true believer of, of Allah. Um, they didn't really become a seafaring culture. We, we know that they, they traded along the Indian Ocean in, in these areas here, but they didn't um, go out across the globe, if you will. This never, never happened. Now, if we look at the right, we're looking at um, Zhang He, or um, as you might I'll also know him, or I like to call him as Chang Ho. Um, he has two names, so I, I will use them interchangeably, Chang Ho and Zhang He. Um, so well before Prince Henry started his explorations, if you will, he set up his station of um, explorers on Sagres, the Chinese had sailed around a quarter of the globe with fleets that dwarfed anything that the Europeans had ever put together. And uh, you'll, you'll see one of the supplementary videos that it says that it wasn't until World War I when the British put together their, their fighting fleet that there was a fleet that topped what the Chinese had built in the 1400s, not just like the late 1400s, but 1406, 1405 through 1433. 
fleets that had up to 30,000 sailors, and I don't mean just sailors, but we're talking about legal people, uh, financial people, historians, philosophers, there were all these different people involved in these crews. This was basically designed to demonstrate the splendor of the Ming Dynasty. All they asked for a return when they would go visit these places was tribute. Basically, get on your knees, recognize us as being the most powerful, give us uh, a little bit of money, and let us take some of your uh, exotic things back to our, our, our home just to show them off to the emperor. But for the most part, this grand fleet, I mean, imagine it pulling up to your port, 317 ships, 30,000 people aboard, and you were going to be impressed, okay? And there was no takeism. It was strictly a cultural greeting and exchange, one in which they wanted to collect tribute and recognition for being the greatest civilization on the planet. And this happened all throughout uh, Africa and India and Arabia and Malaysia. So let's start with why not the Arabs? I mean, I can really summarize this in one sentence, which is they were already there. And this is uh, spoken of in Daniel Borston's The Discoverers. You know, when it comes down to it, they were really spread out ever, everywhere. And I want you to watch the video on Ivan Butatu, and you'll see that in his travels over 30,000 miles, he, was, he rivaled Marco Polo in this regard. He was the great Muslim traveler. Um, he went all the way from Tangier, which is uh, just south of Spain in Africa, all the way to, you know, the far reaches of China. And he stayed within the entire Muslim world in doing so. One of the things that is uh, interesting to note is that they were firmly in place in parts of Europe. Okay, they were up in the Turkey area in the Eastern Mediterranean. They were up in Spain in the Iberian Peninsula. They, as I said, stretched all the way from Africa to China. So they had no, no real need to uh, go any, any other direction except over land. It turns out that the Arabic world was extremely advanced scientifically, geography, astronomy, mathematics, and navigation. They uh, had also mastered navigation uh, on the seas, just not out into the open oceans. In India, there are Hindus, for example, for which it is taboo for them to cross over um, salt water. So that is one thing that is an in inhibitor. And it turned out that there was a great caliph of the uh, Arabic empires. Uh, I can't remember the year it was, but you know, he did consult his wise men and asked whether they should build some fleets and go out on the oceans. And they said, no. And uh, so it's interesting how you can have a leader listen to wise people and those wise people make a decision that can really change the history of the world. The, the real question it, that's interesting is why didn't they ever sell around Africa and sell into the Mediterranean? I mean, they could have easily done that just in the same way that the Portuguese sailed around Africa from the other direction. And it's interesting to note when we talk about the Chinese that they also did not venture around Africa. Though it's hard to say if they had continued their voyages, whether they would have. So down at the bottom, it says, note the Arabs were in Spain for centuries. They did actually invade France. They really did try to move up and take over parts of Europe. But they were soundly defeated in 732 at the Battle of Tours. And um, this was a situation where the French were pretty scared. They knew it was coming. They were totally not organized. And again, a single individual rose up, went around the country, gathered everybody, got them together, and they fought off this attack. And that was the end of the Muslims attacking Europe. And it was such a sound defeat that they were on retreat and then finally exiled from Spain um, at that point. And that was the last time that they had mounted invasions of Europe. One of the things that we know all throughout history is that the, the Mediterranean Sea was a key um, avenue or conduit by which empires were built and lost through 
through shipping. And then, it, of course, it eventually took the Portuguese who were seaward facing to, to venture out into the ocean itself. With the Arabs, you can see in this map here, the Muslims were all across in Africa here and then partially up in Spain. The interesting thing is they, they could have also built ships and sailed across here and not just necessarily gone over land. In the uh, 1400s, uh, you saw the, the Ottoman Empire fill up this area and build into this area. The interesting thing is that the Muslims uh, in the Ottoman Empire had actually built fleets of ships here after the uh, fall of the Mongolian Empire. And they did, they did this trade routes in here that semi-militarily cut off the trade routes uh, from the Genoa and uh, Pisa and um, Florence, and therefore stopped the flow of goods coming into Europe after uh, the Mongolian Empire fell. And that was part of the impetus for Portugal then to sell around Africa. Here's another map showing the trade routes that existed in the uh, Muslim world. And you can see they're quite extensive, stretching through Africa, Arabia, across India into Asia and all the way to the uh, Pacific Ocean here. So they really were pretty much of the known world. They were basically everywhere. They also had these complex sea routes, as you can see, well before the Portuguese came. But again, nothing going out into the oceans, but definitely had seafaring that was happening. This is an example of a two-mast Arabic ship, and you can see the triangular sail. And it turned out that this triangular cell was adopted by the Portuguese to make their caravels. And so they had a combination of square cells and triangular cells that allowed them to tack up wind. So that technology uh, was very important. So that's a statement that in fact, the Arabic world, the, the Muslim world was very good at navigating the oceans or the seas. There, there are some other supplementary solutions um, you know, technology-wise, resource-wise, geographic-wise. So they didn't use nails in their ships. It turns out that uh, even the Vikings used nails in their ships, but the, the Arabs did not use nails in their ships. They used cords from coconut husks, and they thought that nails would actually be pulled out by uh, magnetic stones in the sea. And it's, it's again, uh, really funny how magical thinking can affect the world. They didn't have natural resources that were that you would build a navy with, where you you know the wood that you needed and the iron and the textiles. These things required for massive shipbuilding projects, engineering projects. They didn't didn't have across their their lands. The other thing is that you know, like in Europe, there are all these navigable rivers that you can get from point A to point B. I mean, you can actually go from the Baltic Sea all the way down to Constantinople and into the Mediterranean Ocean through rivers. There's nothing like that really uh, throughout the Muslim countries, just basically inland desert. There was a lot of coral reefs along the uh, coastlines that made it very perilous. And this is one of the reasons that it was viewed as going into the sea was viewed as being perilous. There was no easy source of fresh water and they didn't have necessarily uh, rich amounts of supplies for foods that they could put on the ship. So they, they just hadn't thought about doing major naval organization and going out across the seas. And this last one in red, precedent, this is really kind of an interesting concept because, you know, until Prince Henry had built his, you know, sagres, put together his entire institution with all the logistics for continuous exploration. There was nobody else on the planet had done it. There was no idea in anybody's mind to do that. And again, we found over and over that that is very important. Somebody has to visualize it or the human mind has to visualize it, has to spread consciously among society before the idea can take hold and people can see it as a, a frontier, a physical frontier. There was no precedent for doing this. With no leader, with no resources really to do this, without any impetus to do it because they were everywhere, they never put together seafaring society, if you will, in the sense that the Europeans did or the Chinese were going to see did. There were uh, some consequences to this. So this 
results in, in a sense in a stagnation because it's through expanding into new territories that societies and cultures have thrived and civilizations have thrived and the bringing back of new things into that civilization, the exchange of ideas. You know, you have these trade routes across the Muslim nations, but you don't have new ideas traversing those. There's nothing, uh, no pressures from the outside that change the thinking that would then synergize with what existed and then cause more growth. So things like the great city of Alexandria began to decay, for example. And then, you know, um, they had this seventh wonder of the world here, this, the, this, the lighthouse, and it began to decay. Uh, they had the, the library of Alexandria. It diminished. The thing about that was you have this, this world that is scientifically literate and it stagnates. And so what we're seeing in the yellow box here, even though Islam had, had carried this light of learning, they had developed algebra. Uh, the magnetic compass, the Arabic number system, which we use today, which got rid of the old antiquated and horrible Roman number system, pens, printing, how disease spreads. They, they were full-blown, scientifically cutting edge. But if you look at today, there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Only two people that are Muslims are from Muslim countries have won the Nobel Prize in science and in 46 Muslim countries combined, only 1% of the world's uh, scientific literature is generated uh, by, by these Muslim countries. So this is a complete belly flop of the order of uh, impact on the world, especially scientifically. Once you um, go through the 1500s and the Europeans have spread around the world and things like that, uh, they really had a stranglehold on the power of the entire globe, actually, um, as we'll see. And then, of course, that continued to culminate uh, in, in the 1800s through the colonization of Africa. And it also culminated then after World War I, in which basically the Western powers were able to dictate to the entire world um, how it should unfold. But sometime, you know, around that period, after the 1500s, when the Europeans had spread across the globe, the Muslims found themselves surrounded and they were confined and they became basically bullied. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, which I talked about, had, had set up in this territory here where my mouse is going up and then up into Turkey and then northward up into the southern parts of the, the Slavic areas. Uh, that empire had lasted since 1453, and it finally collapsed in 1918. And he was just constantly being pushed on and pressured and, and diminishing. Um, after World War I in 1918, the Western powers basically carved up the Middle East and some of these African countries. They fixed the borders based upon the way that they knew that they could maintain some control and separate people and keep them, keep them weakened as, as groups. They had such great power and influence that they just basically chopped them up and, and we have the modern day countries, which did not exist at all. So what you see here is that this lack of spreading across the globe in the same sense that the Europeans did meant they became confined and then they were controlled. And so what we see is that even uh, into the world today, we have great conflict in the Middle East that is still going on, that is a remnant of the fact that in 1918, the Western powers came in and chopped up the areas the way they wanted, put in puppet governments, controlled things. And it's been about, you know, a hundred years now of them pushing back and pushing back and pushing back and trying to reestablish their own sovereignty, so to speak. Um, so you can see that the, the Western powers really did uh, control and, and stymie and suppress these, these other nations. The Chinese reach out. This is, um, this is a really fantastic story. What we have here is a picture of Zhang He or Cheng Ho. 
And you can see um, in the back a giraffe that is clearly coming from Africa. The space capsule payload contains a giraffe. This great individual made about seven voyages and covered about a quarter of the globe. When did he do this? He did this from 1405 all the way up to 1433. And Prince Henry didn't start his sagres until the 1440s, really. And he died in 1460. And they had only gotten partially down the coast of Africa by 1460. It wasn't until 1488, if you remember, that Bartholomew Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope and understood there was a sea path to the east to get to India. So back in 1405 and 06, Zheng He, Chang Ho, had 300 and something ships with 30,000 sailors and set out across the globe. Compare and contrast here. Prince Henry, his efforts were a prologue to circumnavigation of the globe, which is a wonderful romantic idea, but it was also a prologue to imperialism and suppression and slavery and what I called takeism, okay, which became colonialism and just all of the negative aspect of taking control of the world and exploiting the world, God, gold, and glory. The Chinese had no such ambitions. They, they sailed in peace. They came in peace. When they rolled up, they were not going to take your gold. They came and they impressed you with their grandiosity. People understood how much power was behind this, that they actually would... Um, I would say bow to them. They call it kowtowing. You've heard the term that, that the leaders of these places, many of them would make the pilgrimage back to the emperor of China so that they could basically bend the knee uh, to the emperor and of course bring some goods and some golds and what they called tribute. So it, it was peaceful, but it also was a way of demonstrating their power and their glory, the Chinese power and glory. In the end, some things politically happened at home and it got shut down. And when it shut down, it got shut down big. And when it got shut down, it became a capital offense to have a two mast ship on the sea. I mean, they just locked the borders and went inward. And what we're gonna see is that had terrible consequences for China because, you know, here, come the Western, here comes the Western world, and they're going to exploit and take whatever they can. And here's a nation that had withdrawn, became pretty much powerless, and had 500 years of turmoil, poverty, warlordism, and is literally only coming out of it uh, in the last 50 years, um, last 25 years. Okay, so this was a dead end, but it could have been world-changing. Here's our hero, Chang Ho or Zheng He. He did his sailing during the Ming Dynasty, which started in 1368 with the fall of the Mongolians. I've told you that story. From 1405 to 1433, he made seven voyages. He was a eunuch. He was a Muslim and he was a eunuch. And one of the supplementary videos you'll see will talk about how he was captured. And when he was captured, he became a confidant of the prince. Uh, of the Ming Dynasty, who eventually became the emperor. And then when he became the emperor, he, he used Chang Ho as a great sea admiral. The fact that Chang Ho was a eunuch was central to why he gained so much power and central to why he lost that power so rapidly. The Ming Dynasty put a lot of resources into demonstrating how grand it was. One of the things they did was they built the Great Wall. Another thing they did was they built the Forbidden City, which is the picture here. This is a, a grand city in which the, a huge entourage built around the emperor and his court uh, existed. And the regular Chinese people were not allowed to ever see the emperor. Here on the right is the emperor's throne. When the uh, 
people from Africa or Arabia or Malaysia or India that came to kowtow, this is where they would come and they would kneel at the bottom of these stairs. In fact, your highness basically is the translation of to bow from the bottom of the stairs. Now, the story is that in this environment of the forbidden city, you have many tiers of individuals who uh, sort of circles, those that can be close to the emperor, those that can be held at bay by a certain inner circle, those that can be held at bay by that circle, and then et cetera. The most tight inner circle were the eunuchs. They were allowed to basically whisper into the ear of the emperor. They could stand up next to him while he was sitting on the throne. And they were allowed to walk amongst the families. There, there would be a harem. And of course, that's why they allowed the eunuchs there because they could be no threat to the harem. And so they, they knew the women. They knew the, 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 the family members. They were able to understand all the inner things that were going on in the family of the, of the emperor. And uh, this, this allowed them to have a lot of control and power. On the circle outside them were the intellectuals, the ministers, and they had to stand at the bottom of the stairs. They never were able to whisper into the ear of the emperor. In fact, a eunuch could actually persuade a, an emperor to have a minister or an intellectual, a scholar, be killed. There was a story where a, a eunuch had one of the... Um, astrologers and intellectual uh, actually tortured and killed uh, through persuasion of the emperor. And of course, that created great tension between the intellectuals who thought that they were holding together a long history of, say, Confucianism and the uh, traditions of China, whereas the eunuchs were considered to be a, an uneducated class of people. So there's a lot of, lot of tension, and this is going to be key to why uh, when Chang Ho fell, he fell hard, okay? Um, so they were a privileged class, as I was saying. In an arbitrary government like a, a monarchy, this does mean that the opportunity to seize power can be there. It was very, very concerning to the intellectuals and the ministers that the, the power could be seized by the eunuchs. It was really a, a tension. When... Young Lo, who is the prince, uh, the second emperor of the Ming dynasty, he lived from 1359 to 1424. When he became emperor, he decided to have Zhang He or Cheng Ho build this huge fleet. Literally, they put together amazing shipyards. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine now, you know, back in those days, 1400s, they developed these gigantic shipyards uh, on the order of the, the type of thing that would be done during a major war today. They made at least 300 or so ships that went out on these excursions. And um, the largest of that you can see in this picture here is the treasury ship, which had nine masts. It had a beam of 180 feet. Now, this is a caravel, the kind that the Portuguese sailed and Christopher Columbus sailed. And so you can see this was the biggest uh, ship they had on the oceans, and these are the biggest ships that the Chinese had on the oceans. In addition to the treasury ship, they had the horse ship, the supply ships, the billet ships, and even combat ships to make sure they were protected. They had a fleet of 317 of these ships crewed by 30,000 people. This is a picture of what it must have looked like to some degree if you could have seen it. And what I want to say is, if you've never seen anything like this, come from what looked like infinity, okay, from over the horizon of the ocean, and this comes, and some strange people come, you are going to be in total awe of what you're seeing, especially with the riches and the golds and the ceremony that is involved here. The difference between this armada is that it wasn't an armada. The Portuguese, when they sailed around in the 1490s, almost 100 years later, 80 years later, they came and they left naval attachments. That never happened with the Chinese. There was never that tension or that destruction. They did not disrupt the trade that was happening. They did not 
take slaves. They did not take the ports. None of that happened. So he was not seeking any of these slaves, gold, or anything. The idea was, as it's written in blue here, nothing would be done that would suggest the Chinese needed anything that anybody else had. They are the central kingdom. They are the greatest. They are to be admired for being the greatest and the one and true civilization on the planet. So display the splendor and power of the dynasty. Use nonviolent techniques, but still extracted, if you will, some reverence, some gold, animals, and spices and things like that. But they didn't, they did it in, under the guise that those, that was paying tribute to them, recognizing them for being great. Not that they needed it. They didn't need it. They established no permanent basis with any of these tributary states that they had visited. They wanted to make the world whole, a unified planet of admiration for them. And they wanted to do it nonviolently. I am sure that later on, when the Portuguese came through, as we showed earlier, when Vasco da Gama showed up in Calicut, he must have been received openly, especially after what had happened with the Chinese some 80 years earlier. I'm sure that memory existed, but it was completely different. In this case, the, the Portuguese came in and it was all about seizing power and taking. So here's the um, map that's similar to the map that I have in my background. The first era is an era of six uninterrupted voyages, one pretty much right after the other. It started in 1405 and went to 1424. And these were setting up these tributary relationships. Um, you can see the part of the world that this is covering in the upper left. And then you can see some of the sea paths that were taken by Cheng Ho. Now, again, he was covering a lot of shipping routes that were well established during the monsoon marketplace. So there was nothing particularly cutting edge about the shipping lanes that he chose, though he did go down toward near South Africa. It would have been very interesting if he had gone around South Africa, and then he would have gone into territories where he would be in terra incognita, if you will, or mare incognita. So the state giving tribute was not submitting to the conqueror. Rather, it was acknowledging that they, they were the one true society and beyond anybody's assistance. In, in 1424, uh, young Lo died, as you can see, he lived till 1424, and these anti-maritime forces swelled. In other words, the intellectuals and ministers and scholars who uh, didn't like the eunuch class were all about destroying the power and glory of any of the eunuchs and all of them. And so they, they picked on this, uh, these maritime uh, activities as one of, because it was a, a very glorious thing going on for the eunuchs, particularly Chang Ho. But somehow, Cheng Ho was able to squeeze out a last um, excursion in 1433, his, his most extravagant voyage, his seventh voyage. After that happened, the power struggle continued, and the, the intellectuals and the ministers overthrew the unit class and the emperor. They completely replaced the power structure with a new emperor, and the eunuchs were out. And when the eunuchs were out, Cheng Ho was out. They used the sea voyages as a indication of the megalomania and the wastefulness of Yang Lo, whom they had just overthrown. So the new emperor forbade that the subjects of anybody would do anything abroad. But this is where we get the beginning of the isolationism. So the second bullet here we see, you can't go abroad. If you're outside of the country, you are outside of the country illegally. And it was a capital punishment that behead you. The imperial edict for stopping the voyages happened that year. Others followed in 1449 and 1452. These imposed savage punishments for anybody who ventured abroad. So it, isolationism was taken very seriously. And this really came from the scholars of Confucius who really felt that they needed to purify China and its culture. And the way to do that was to shut down the borders and not have the exchange of these ideas that we were talking about 
are so important for a, a civilization to remain vibrant, especially when other civilizations around them are changing. 1498, Vasco da Gama arrives in India. By 1500, over in China, it's a capital offense to have a seagoing junk. Okay, by 1525, all the officials were told to destroy all the ships and arrest anybody who was a mariner. By 1551, it was a crime of espionage. Okay, and we all know what the crime of espionage means. It's capital punishment. So what we see is that at a time when the Europeans are just getting started, the Chinese have basically completely locked their borders. They were, as I show in the red bullet here, they were fully equipped with the technology, the intelligence, the national resources to become the discoverers. As Borson says, the Chinese doom themselves to be the discovered. And what I'm gonna talk about here is that it goes beyond that simple statement that they, they doom themselves to be the discovered. It goes to the point where they doom themselves to poverty and chaos for 500 years. Now, what I'd like to just ask right now is, Let's say Cheng Ho sailed around Africa with his 300 ships and his treasury ships with nine masts on them that dwarfed anything a European had seen and sailed up to the Mediterranean and sailed past Gibraltar and sailed into the Mediterranean and parked their fleet there. What do you think the Europeans would have done? This is now, remember, this is 1405 to 1433. So let's say this happened around 1440 which is about after the time that the Ottoman Empire had taken the Eastern Mediterranean uh, with their shipping and their trade and shut down the trade in Europe. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, would they have been attacked as enemies? Would they have been seen as a friend that they would try to um, embrace and then destroy the Ottoman Empire? Would they have more different nations gone out into the sea and the ocean, realizing that you could get to far lands doing this. There's so many unknowns, but the fact of the matter is, I think the world clearly would have evolved totally differently if Cheng Ho and the Chinese had continued to do their explorations and had met the Portuguese halfway up Africa in 1460 or any number of possible things that could have happened. The world will never know. What we're going to find out is that over the next 500 years, say from 1500 to, to 2000, particularly from 1600, 1700, 1800 and growing, the Western nations, the Dutch, the British, the French, the Spanish, they extracted everything they could from every lands they could forgot to mention the Portuguese as well. British silver was being paid to the Chinese for silk when the uh, British Empire had built up the uh, East India Company. And so they loved their tea, they loved their silk, and they were paying for it with silver. And so one of the things they decided to do was, hey, you know, these Chinese, they're, they're very isolated and whatnot, that we can, we can control them. So let's trade opium for the silk and the tea, and they got them hooked on opium. So now they solved their foreign exchange problem, and they made the, the Chinese be pretty much doped up on opium, and they were able to take more control about them. Uh, this is a stage later in the in 1840s for what's called the Opium War. And that was another devastating consequence for China because they lost that war and then they were occupied, decisively uh, lost the war and they were occupied by foreign countries. I call it 500 years of poverty, harassment and more poverty. In the North, the Mongolians were constantly harassing them. In 1449, they captured the emperor. In 1452, uh, the, the Mongolian leader continues to hassle Chinese along the northern border. They even reached the suburbs of Beijing. So by, by just closing your borders, you basically are going to get encroached upon. And so that's coming in, that's coming in from the north. And then from the sea, Japanese pirates are able to roam freely along 
and the coastline, okay? Because there's, there's no Navy power, there's no control there of the seas. And so they were able to roam freely and they're just attacking up and down the coastlines and, and uh, pillaging and doing the things that, you know, like the Vikings did in the beginning. Later on in the 1600s, which we're going to talk about, was a tremendous period for the Western nations where they were basically exploiting the globe and becoming, ex these nations were becoming extremely powerful and wealthy. There were internal rebellions, continuous internal rebellions going along and attacks along the Chinese borders because of this turmoil and the loss of all this stuff and undermined the regime so much that basically local warlords were able to take control. And so through this period, in the late 1600s, all the way into the 1800s, you have this period of warlordism. And these are areas where you have set up area little fiefdoms. And, you know, it's kind of like the, the what we consider the fiefdom of um, medieval Europe, where, you know, you had a local lord with a castle and then you had the other people that didn't own land, but worked for them, but then were protected by them. And so they had their own military and uh, uh, the borders of these were their skirmishes. And it was a very, very, very tumultuous couple of hundred years. We've talked about corruption, no centralization of, you know, respect, so to speak, of the institutions, reform after reform, and eventually the uh, armies uh, are absolutely destroyed in the 1800s. And then again, in the late 1800s, there's the Japanese war with the Chinese. And they just basically are getting their chronometers handed to them everywhere because they just have not developed holistically as a civilization. In 1900, which is just shortly after the Japanese war, we get something called the Boxer Rebellion. And uh, this is in northern China. And so there was a conservative group that was against the imperialists, and they wanted to return China to the old way. Now, the Empress Dowager, which is to say the mother of the queen, sometimes the Dowager doesn't like to not be at the seat of power anymore. So the Empress Dowager, it says here, probably wanting to get their grip back on power and uh, take control, sided with the boxers. Uh, and so they were emboldened and they advanced on Beijing and all hell broke loose. So what happened was eight Western nations got together and invaded China to rescue China from itself. British, Japanese, Russian, Italian, German, French, US and Australian troops came in an alliance and defeated the boxers. And so once they had done that, they were in control of China. So that's what happened in 1900. And so here is a political cartoon on the right, a French political cartoon showing England, this is Victoria, the Kaiser from Germany, the Tsar from Russia, and I don't know who this is represented from France. And then here's the emperor of Japan. Of course, here's China in the back going, help me, help me. Um, I wanna let you know that uh, these three people are all family, okay, uh, the cousins, uh, and nephews. So let's then just sort of look at this little timeline in the, in the bottom corner that happened after we had the Boxer Rebellion and have the foreign nations carve up China for themselves. So by 1911, China has gone into civil war. That civil war lasted from 1911 to 1949. It went through World War I and then resumed. It went through World War II and then it resumed. In about three to four years after World War II, the communists took over with Mao Zedong, and they've been communists ever since. And that was very scary. Um, it's going to sort of morph into our Cold War between the United States and the, and the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union went communist in 1917. And... Uh, then after World War II in 1945, there was this Cold War that really went into place and then that culminated in the space race and beyond. But during the Cold War, the Chinese became communists and that really scared the bejeebies out of the, out of the United States. Now, Mao Zedong was not a good leader. You may, you've heard of Hitler, you know, you've heard of Stalin, wow, 
Mao Zedong is right up there with those guys. And he did all kinds of political things that totally uh, purged people, complete upheaval, put together his little red armies, knocked on people's houses, sent them off to concentration camps, broke up the intellectuals. In 1970 to 1977, he instigated something called the Cultural Revolution. And this was basically destroy the past of China, get rid of all of the ancient history. We are reinventing China in this new communist mold. And uh, it was a horrible, terrible time where people persecuted starvation and uh, basically the destruction of many of their heirlooms through their culture. In the 1980s, they begin to have uh, some reforms. And in, um, in the 2000s, they are now waking as a superpower. And that history's not written yet, but they are definitely not the China of old. That is the last of our uh, slides for this particular lecture. And um, I just wanted to, uh, as I said, do a compare and contrast between the Muslim nations and the Chinese and talk about the outcomes of those two uh, civilizations, if you will, uh, compared to what the Europeans civilization did. Now, um, I had to go forward in time a little bit uh, to, to discuss the outcomes of the uh, Arabic world, you know, how they were carved up after World War I, and then there's been this battle for their reclaiming their sovereignty uh, ever since. And then the outcomes of China uh, with the warlords and particularly the, the outcome of this Boxer Rebellion uh, and then the civil wars and, and the communist rule. Um, so the point is that they did not cover the globe. They did not influence the globe with their religions, with their languages and um, with their economies and their science and, and things like that. It was the Western world who's become dominant in that. In our next lectures, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about development of what we call state-sponsored merchants or state-sponsored companies that have a connection with the government and have the power to wage war, but yet are private companies as well. And this strange symbiotic relationship that came together in the process, uh, they exploited the world and became all powerful. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. I will see you soon and hope you enjoyed the lecture.